So now we're going to look into trusted computing. So what we will talk about is first introduce the desired properties, then we will look at uh, two things that provide this. So the trusted platform module, which is a standard uh, that provides some of these properties. And then we will look into trusted execution environments and particularly we will use Intel's SGX or software guard extensions as an example. And finally, uh, we will terminate with the most important part of the discussion, which is the root of trust, because uh, to have trusted computing, we need to root our trust somewhere. Uh, so we'll focus on that problem uh, the last. So let's start with the desired properties. So the idea, uh, what if a program running in a system could ascertain the integrity of the system? Yeah, because it's hard for a program to do any reasoning about its execution environment because it's the environment that's executing the program. Yeah, so it can completely, completely fool the program as it likes. So for instance, uh, this program, um, the idea is that the program could ascertain that it's running a particular operating system, that the oper operating system is on modified and that the program itself is unmodified, which is uh, something which is very difficult to uh, to determine by itself. Uh, particularly the operating system could be simulated and uh, with virtualization you can do pretty much anything. Uh, so it's hard for a program to, to actually do this. Uh, so it needs some, some support. Uh, so remote attestation is essentially uh, captures uh, this name and remote attestation also allows you to do this remotely so that you know that the remote system is actually performing uh, as expected that it's running uh, what is uh, expected. So the way we do this is that we add a tamper resistant hardware chip uh, to our computing system and this system uh, this chip is put in the system in such a way that it can talk to the rest of the hardware. Uh, so it has access to, to one of the main buses, so it's, it can communicate with the rest of the, of the hardware in the system. And then this uh, tamper resistant hardware chip is designed in such a way that it uh, can query the, the rest of the system, so the hardware, and uh, create a digitally signed summary of the hardware uh, that is there and uh, that it can attest that uh, this is actually correct and not a simulation. And this uh, hardware chip can even attest uh, the running software. So we could potentially uh, attest that we are running the, the correct operating system. It was uh, booted with a proper bootloader and so on. Uh, so we can get, uh, a report on which state this uh, system is currently in. Uh, and another uh, property that we want, another feature that we would like to have is uh, that we want to protect private data by binding it to the platform. So we can use this hardware chip for encryption and only the chip has the key for uh, decrypting this and encrypting it. Uh, which means that uh, we ask the chip to encrypt this or decrypt this and it will do it and return the, the cipher text or, or the plain text. And uh, this chip can actually also include the, its current state and uh, also the current state of the system to be part of the key, which means that the system must be in a particular state to uh, decrypt this and there is no way to fool the, this chip to uh, uh, pretend that the system is in this state to, to make it decrypt. Uh, so it will communicate directly to the hardware and uh, it itself will ascertain the state of the system. So whether, one sh whether the chip should uh, decrypt or not. So one example uh, use of this is that, yeah, we want to encrypt our own data so no one can steal it and decrypt it elsewhere. 
but however, if you change things too much, then uh, neither can we. So it must be in the state uh, that uh, we had set uh, to be able to, to decrypt it. There is no, no recovery. Another example used is to encrypt media content with certain requirements. So for instance, the hardware with only, with only decrypt uh, if you run an unmodified version of a DRM enforcing uh, media player. So you can't, you can't play the media if it's, uh, if it's a software which is not approved because uh, then it might be a software which exports this media and the media ends up in, in Pirate Bay which uh, the content owner uh, wouldn't want. So there is this uh, standard uh, trusted platform module. Uh, it's an industry standard and it's maintained by the trusted computing group. And most computers uh, has such a chip. Uh, so in every, every modern laptop and uh, probably most desktop uh, desktop computers too, uh, they will have such a chip. Uh, and this uh, trusted platform module has uh, some functionality. For instance, it has a random number generator. Uh, it can generate crypto keys. It can do remote attestation, like we talked about. It can also do binding, which uh, encrypts the data with the TPM binding key, which means it's uh, bound to to the hardware, uh, so uh, you can only use it with that hardware. Uh, you can also do sealing, which is uh, similar to binding, but this was uh, what we talked about, that the TPM includes the state uh, of the system to allow decryption, which means you, you seal it and you can only open it if the, if the TPM is an, in a particular state. So it's, so it's similar to, to binding, except you include the state. Binding doesn't include the state, then it's just tied to the system. So that's the, that's the idea. And another uh, bit more modern uh, construction is uh, trusted execution environments. So this is of sorts an extension of uh, the TPMs, uh, because here you can actually do uh, more execution of random, uh, I mean, arbitrary code. So the idea behind uh, a trusted ex execution environment or secure enclave, uh, which is the Intel terminology for Intel SGX, uh, here we consider the operating system and potentially a hypervisor, if this, uh, ver this is a virtualized system. Uh, we consider those two as hostile. And this uh, trusted execution environment or secure enclave is a secure computing environment inside uh, this hostile environment. And this one is uh, depending on uh, depending on implementation, it might be an extra chip uh, that's on the hardware that can be accessed and used, or in the case of uh, Intel's SGX, it's uh, part of the processor, so it's inside the processor. So some highlights of uh, Intel's software guard extensions, so SGX. So the enclave, which is Intel terminology for the trusted execution environment, the memory of the enclave, uh, so meaning both data and code, is encrypted. And uh, so the, the memory of this uh, trusted execution environment, it's stored in the main memory of the computer system, but it's stored there only in encrypted form. And it's decrypted on the fly inside, only inside the processor. So the processor uh, decrypts it when it comes in from the memory and when it goes back out to back to the, to the system memory, it's re-encrypted again, so, so then it's encrypted. So uh, the processor ensures that this uh, memory is only decrypted for code inside the enclave. So no other code can see this, so the operating system can't, can't read what the hell this is because they, they can only read the uh, ciphertext 
and not the plain text and the operating system can't access uh, these things inside the processor because the, it's the processor that also runs the operating system. So it will have uh, written this out to memory, encrypted it and, and removed it from inside the processor when uh, it has switched to the operating system. So it's only the code inside the enclave uh, that can uh, read this memory. And uh, we also have remote attestation for these enclaves, uh, which is a nice feature. So you can actually remotely attest uh, an enclave, uh, so a trusted execution environment inside uh, the processor. It also provides sealed storage, so you can uh, tie this, uh, uh, lock this uh, data down to, to match this en enclave. Uh, the, the downsides, I mean, the, you, you need to trust, uh, put some trust somewhere. And in this case, you must trust the CPU to, to actually perform uh, this. And that, of course, means you must trust the CPU manufacturer to actually have done this correctly and that they don't cheat you. Because the CPU manufacturer is actually uh, quite involved in uh, the remote attestation, for instance, because then you must trust the CPU, uh, which has a uh, cryptographic key, which is embedded inside the CPU by the manufacturer. Uh, so you, you need a public key infrastructure involving the CPU manufacturer so that you know that, okay, this key is actually, actually belongs to the CPU. You can, of course, set it up yourself and verify it, but then uh, then you, you can only be sure about this particular processor, which might be fine for your use case. But if you want to be able to execute secure enclaves on arbitrary processors uh, in a network, then it's probably easier to use the public key infrastructure provided by the uh, Intel in this case, in the case of uh, SGX. And uh, example use cases, so it's for remote computation. So you encrypt some code and uh, the data for this enclave that's running on uh, a processor somewhere, and then you send it to, to this uh, remote uh, system. And then it's the operating system, of course, that uh, receives this over the network and passes it through drivers and so on, uh, and eventually, it ends up inside this en enclave. And it's important to note here that the, the data is encrypted for that particular enclave. So the operating system of the recipient system, it only sees ciphertext. So it's only inside the enclave that uh, your code and data will be uh, visible. Uh, another uh, use case is secure web browsing, so you can uh, lock things into an enclave. Digital rights management, uh, because then you can uh, run this code inside and you can ensure that uh, no other uh, application running on the system can access this data. So you can actually uh, have a pretty tight environment for your digital material that you don't want to end up on Pirate Bay. Uh, another use case is, of course, to conceal uh, proprietary algorithms and encryption keys, because those you can embed in the enclave and send to the, to the client system. But, uh, only the, the enclave can, can access this uh, data. So no other application program or the operating system uh, can access uh, these things. Another uh, more elaborate example uh, is uh, the messaging app Signal, which uses uh, Intel's SGX to, uh, it uses those enclaves to uh, do the contact discovery. So whenever uh, a user has Signal installed, they also have a lot of contacts with whom they'd like to communicate. And to be able to do that, you need to know which contacts also have Signal. So at some point, you need to compare your contact list with the registered users of Signal. And of course, the user don't want to just advertise their contact list to Signal. Uh, that would be bad for privacy. But also Signal wouldn't want to just uh, 
advertise all registered users of the service either. So the idea here is that the phone, uh, so the app on the phone, actually uh, runs a secure enclave on Signal server. So the user phone uh, provides the code to be run on Signal server and the Signal server runs Intel processors so they will uh, set up this enclave with a public key and everything and then the user phone will send uh, the user's contact list to this enclave running on the server and it will send it encrypted so the server actually any other software running on the server can't see the the contact list so the user phone can actually be certain that uh, it's the correct code running on the server so no malicious code because the user has set it up and it has the verification the remote attestation of this uh, so it knows that uh, only the this particular code which is legitimate can decrypt uh, the contact list and, and run this. So once the phone has sent the contact list to the, this enclave on the, running on the server, the enclave can access stuff on the server. So it can uh, look up the registry and uh, uh, check which of the registered users are in this contact list. So the user doesn't get uh, to know the contact list either. Uh, and uh, then uh, the result is still encrypted because it's run in the enclave. So the enclave uh, sends that back uh, to the user or the, the enclave outputs uh, an encrypted blob, so a ciphertext which the server sends back to the user and the user can decrypt it. Uh, however, uh, this is a kind of sim uh, simplified explanation of how it's done because you, you really need to be careful how you do this. So particularly how you implement this comparison between the registered users and uh, the, uh, the, the, user, the user's contact list. Because uh, what can happen is that the, the server, so the operating system of the server, can still uh, view memory accesses. So depending on how you do this comparison, uh, the operating system can see which parts of memory is accessed and uh, thus figure out which contacts are uh, actually in the, the user's contact list. Uh, so uh, it's really important to be very careful how you design these algorithms because even if everything is encrypted, uh, that metadata can leak a lot. So I recommend you to, to read this uh, a short uh, exposition by the signal people in how this uh, system works. So how they, how you must implement it to not leak information to the service, to, to the signal service uh, servers. Uh, so uh, that's an important aspect of this. So there are, of course, various implementations of this. So the Intel SGX, it's available in, in uh, all Intel Core processors from the sixth generation, which was around 2015. Uh, QEMU uh, also supports Intel SGX for virtualization purposes. There is also an open uh, SGX simulator by Georgia Tech, which uh, you can use to, to simulate SGX code. And of course, there are uh, processors by other manufacturers which have similar features uh, that you can also uh, use, but uh, it's SGX that's the, the most popular one at the moment. Uh, so that's what we are, why we are uh, talking about that one. And of course, there, there are attacks against uh, SGX. So there are several, several publications uh, by researchers which uh, point out these, uh, these vulnerabilities, which can and cannot be fixed. So you should uh, read up on the current attacks against SGX uh, before you rely on it. So there are some caveats like that. So the, the last part that we are going to cover is the root of trust, because we, we need to root our trust somewhere. 
And as I said before, you when you use uh, SGX, you, you need to uh, trust Intel. So there are basically two approaches. So one is that we trust the hardware manufacturer and its firmware is read only or uh, digitally signed, so it can't uh, get malicious updates and so on. So this is the approach, uh, the traditional approach, which is taken by uh, both uh, the trust and platform module and things like SGX. So SGX has, uh, has also uh, a certificate inside the, the processor, which only accepts uh, firmware and microcode updates which are signed by Intel. So that prevents any malicious entity from uh, putting in malicious code inside uh, this trusted hardware. Because uh, if you get malicious, hard malicious software into it, then of course it's game over. So you, you need to trust the hardware manufacturer that it's correctly done and it's read-only or that they don't uh, mess up these updates. Uh, so that's that's an important aspect. The second approach is uh, to test it, and this is uh, really, really difficult, uh, but we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. So the first, uh, the first example, uh, we trust the manufacturer, so then we can, the manufacturer embeds a digital certificate in the hardware so we can verify that this processor is actually, uh, we're actually talking to a processor which is made by, for instance, Intel. And uh, it's digitally signed, so we know we are talking to this piece of hardware which is certified by Intel. And uh, all the digital uh, signatures uh, work out. And then this hardware can sign all the output and then we can verify that, okay, it's made by this key, which is signed by uh, Intel. So yes, it should be, be correct. Yeah. And the, the, other, uh, the other part, the other approach is that we test the hardware and then we must test this hardware or the software on board the hardware uh, in a very particular way. Uh, it's uh, very important to that you test it correctly because uh, otherwise malware can hide and, and pass all your tests. So this was uh, published in, in a paper from 2019. Uh, so you have a reference uh, in these slides. We'll uh, get to a URL uh, on the next slide. Uh, and in this, the way this works is that we have a system we'd like to test. And this system has memory M and registers R. And we need a verifier, so a trusted verifier. Yeah, the, the verifier might be us, so we can, we can trust it. And uh, the verifier asks the system to in initialize the memory and the registers to some predetermined value. And then uh, the verifier asks the system to compute a, uh, yeah, compute a, a response uh, to a challenge. So this is of course uh, based on a, on a nonce uh, N and uh, the state of the registers and the memory which the verifier asked the system to initialize. And then this algorithm uh, takes uh, M words and T time to, to compute. And uh, if you do this correctly, meaning that if this algorithm, uh, CMT here, is space-time optimal, which means that the lower bound equals the upper bound for the algorithm, which means there is no way to uh, do the computation faster than this algorithm, uh, then, uh, uh, so that's a requirement that we have and that this uh, function is also second pre-image free, which means it behaves uh, similarly to a hash function, so it's uh, hard to predict. Then uh, we are ensured that this cannot be done in fewer than m words and less than time t. And this means that uh, if we have these properties, then there is no possibility for 
uh, this system to be able to compute the correct answer on time and for malware to exist in the system uh, at the same time. So if there is malware in there, then either it cannot uh, do this computation on time or it has to use more space uh, than it actually has. So we really need to know the specifications of the system to design the test here. Uh, so, uh, so that's the that's the thing. We that's the that's the criteria we need to be able to test this uh, properly. And also, if uh, this uh, system that we are testing has several chips with several processors and several several memory uh, units, then we must test all of them at the same time. Uh, because otherwise they might be able to, to help each other. Uh, and uh, then malware can hide in the system. So for instance, malware can hide in one, uh, one chip while another is being tested and then it reinfects that chip uh, while the other chip is being tested and then that one reinfects uh, the other one after the test is done. And we, we of course can't accept that because we, we need to make sure that it's completely malware free. That's the purpose of the test. So that's an, that's an overview of, of uh, the details that are in this paper by Gligor and Maverick Wu. So it was published in NDSS in 2019. So you have the, the full report uh, on this URL. And there is also a video presentation of the paper here, which I recommend. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very good presentation by Gligor. Uh, so it has some really technical details, but it really gives a very nice uh, high level overview too, uh, which has some more details than uh, what I just said. And that's the, that's the end of uh, this session. Thanks a lot.